Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to another JetBrains webinar. Uh, I'm really excited about today's topic because, you know, personally, I've been looking at Blazor United and looking at WebAssembly stuff. So our guest today is going to be talking about that. But before I introduce him, uh, first, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, but let me do some housekeeping here. So uh, there's a lot of people in the chat right now. So please, we love your questions. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask me or our guest today about the topic, please put it in the chat. Uh, we always have a lot of good conversation at the end of this webinar. So stick around for those questions and answers because there's a lot of information there. So please stay around. A big question everyone always asked, is this session being recorded? Yes, it is. It'll be available on JetBrains TV. So be sure to like and subscribe to see all of our content. Uh, especially I know people are busy, so they might need to drop off, go do some work, come back. We'll still be here. So on that note, uh, I'd love to introduce our guest today, Joshua Ryder, uh, also known as Top Swag Code. Uh, I promise we didn't force him to change his last name. That was his real name. So <laughs> Joshua, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm really excited about your topic. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, let's get started. Uh, I'll give you the stage. I'll monitor the chat. Again, everybody remember, ask questions, uh, and I'll ask Joshua those questions. So go ahead, stage is yours. Yeah. So first, the mandatory, who am I? My full name is Joshua Jesper Krepel Ryder. It's not easy for anyone to pronounce anywhere in the world. So I work for a small company called iPaper in Denmark, doing digitizing experiences and such stuff as that. And I don't have a Twitter handle, never had, never will. At this point, it doesn't really make any sense. So if you want to catch me, you should write me an email or yeah, find me on LinkedIn. So first off, WebAssembly. It's a broad topic and it's been in the web for quite some time now. So in short, it's called WASM and it's a binary instruction format. And uh, it's pretty cool because it's efficient, fast, fast, safe, and it's part of our own platform. So it works in all the browsers. So what's it's new is that we have this thing called VASI. So it's WebAssembly system interface. So instead of only having WebAssembly in the browser, some smart guys say, hey, wouldn't it be awesome to have it on the server as well because it's so secure and fast. So that left us with, we have WebAssembly on the client, on the server, and as plugin slash modules. So I'll just go through all of them now. So first, like you can write your WASM modules, services, clients in all the programming languages. It, if you're writing PHP, .NET, Go, Rust, like nearly all of them today have compilers that are the same and compile into WASM. So on the client, like we just talked about, we have the Blazor stuff that you all heard about. I won't go too deep into details because I think most of the people here today already know a bunch about Blazor, but more or less it's just the Razor syntax that we know and love. We can write that directly in the browser and have it running there. So I think we've already spent uh, too much time talking, so let's start taking some actual demos. So I'll just take my writer ID in here. So here I have a small console application that creates a small website. It's pretty simple. It just say, okay, I have my main JS it creates for me. I allow it to like do some unsafe stuff. It's not too important. And this is just what is default created for me when I create a new project of a web type with WASM. So what I get is just this basic page. I added a diff to show the results so we don't have to go inside the console. In here, I have some basic JavaScript to load WebAssembly. And in here in the program, I have the actual code. So just to save space, I just put it all in program, but we can make it nice and clean, but more or less, the way it works is you have some classes, you say what you want to export, and you do some stuff. So if I take a browser down, you can see here. So this is my page. I'm getting the Fibonacci and the results. And this is C-sharp in the browser. 
it's pretty simple, not too much to say about it, but you can do all kinds of amazing stuff. It doesn't look too awesome, but trust me, it is. So the guys at Figma, they are already big users of WebAssembly. So they have this huge app for making UX where you can drag and drop and all kind of stuff. And they're running into JavaScript problems that their load times starting going 10 seconds and beyond for loading like these huge views, dragging things around. And they have made this awesome blog post, how they increase their speed by three times by going to WebAssembly. So just quickly to look at the numbers, I'll just zoom a bit. Okay, it didn't work, but you can see it here. Like they went from JavaScript for a large document loading for about like 12 seconds to load within like three seconds. And the same empty project for nearly instant, which normally took a couple of seconds. So you can do some truly amazing performance optimization by moving from JavaScript over to WebAssembly. But of course it's only like usable if you have something really, really big and heavy. And then we have the madman, Steve Sanderson himself. He has this GitHub page that he's hosting. And for you guys out there that doesn't know GitHub pages, it's the static side. So what that means is you can't run any backend on it. It's only static files. So he created this project where he runs a server inside of the browser. So the way it looks, so if I just open the tools here, I'll just reload. You can see the server is starting up in the browser. There's no external calls. Everything is inside. So if I go into the API, I can see I have some endpoints. I can see it's still GitHub pages. So there's no server. The server is running on my machine inside the browser. So if I go back again, I can go to the form. I can start adding some more. I can go back home go back to my API and I can see I've now created stuff. So all of this is being cached locally in my browser. So there's no network. It's all just local on my machine in my browser. So it's pretty cool that you can have an entire website running on the client. So if you wanted to, you could like do some sync stuff. So have everything running local and then sync slowly between the server and the web. And that's just some of the basic examples of what you can do. But I would warn, this is not a good common practice. And uh, he also said so himself that he wouldn't recommend anyone doing this. So I'll just go back to the slides. So as you see, there's big warnings. Please do not do this at home. This is just a demo showing that it's capable of doing it. You will most likely get hurt or get your job hurt if you try to do this in production. So the client stuff is what we all heard about for like nearly 10 years now with WebAssembly and the Blazor stuff also that's slowly been building up over time. But what the really cool stuff I think is having WebAssembly on the server side. Before I actually move on, is there any questions so far? Uh, not specifically about Wasm. Most people are talking about Razor. I personally love Razor. You probably yeah. love Razor. Uh, but <laughs> other than that, uh, no question. Cool. So continue. So on the server side, on the left side here, I'm showing a lot of bunch of runtimes. On the right side, there's a bunch of cloud providers. So there's a lot more than I'm showing here. This is just the ones I've heard most about. So Western Time is the one I use for development. Western Edge is like for running on the edge. It's a really lightweight implementation, and then there's Wasmer, that's pretty much the same as Western Time. It's just two competitors building the same runtime, more or less, with minor differences. And for the hosting, like we have Azure, Western Cloud, Ferrymon, and Cloudflare, like some of them I mentioned. Of course, you can have this on AVS and whatnot. But Asia has some cool stuff right now where they enable um, WASI file deployments in the A in the Kubernetes clusters. So you can actually start, instead of using Docker, you can actually use these Wasm files for deployments. And um, Wasm Cloud, yeah, they are fully committed to doing Wasm stuff and the same with Perimon. 
So there are some pretty awesome stuff going on in the space right now. <clears throat> so what is the sandbox and how does it work? So here's just a small example. So um, you can't see my mouse, but the first example is just, OK, I have this Wasm file. I'm trying to access a file. I'm just getting an error. Hey, you don't have access to access this file, because per default, you don't have access to anything. The only thing you have is some memory allocated, and then you can do whatever you want to do in that memory, but you cannot do anything to the surrounding world. So in the next box, you can see, OK, this time I'm actually mounting a directory and saying, OK, you can work within this little space of uh, the disk. And this time, I'm allowed to do some stuff. And I can open the file, and I can see the changes. In the third example, I'm still mounting my uh, directory. But this time, I'm trying to be a hacker. I'm trying to go outside, finding config files, passwords, whatnot. And this time, again, I'm just being told, sorry, you do not have access to do this stuff. And there's a lot of stuff besides this. Like You can say, no access to internet, no clock. No, you can't use more than two gigabytes of memory or maybe even two megabytes of memory. There's a lot of stuff you can do. So again, I'll do some demo. I'll just find it on my screen, just a moment. Where did it go? Sorry. There it is. So here is a basic website that you've probably all seen before. I have some uh, minimal API for getting some stuff. I have some uh, racer pages as well. I have my weather forecast. And this is all fine and dandy. But uh, that's actually added some cool stuff in here. So um, it's using a VASIC connection listener to actually give us access to the internet and actually open up the ports that I actually want. And I'm also using this use bundled static files. So what that, this does is it's actually taking all the images and all the CSS and all the stuff, putting in my WASI file so I can use it directly. So if I just press here, run, I can see I'll just be running it in here. I'll just take my screen down just a moment. So this is actually running inside of uh, WebAssembly. So how can I see this? I can like just show you the endpoint first for showing like the weather forecast, like you've seen a hundred times before. Nice and simple. I also have a racer page I can put in, and what's Pretty nice, it's actually this time I'm running inside of Wasm, so it doesn't know the underlying OS, like I'm running Windows. The clock is injected, and uh, as you can see, actually, my system clock is not the same as my Wasm clock. So my system clock is saying it's 4.13, but my Wasm clock is saying it's 14.13 instead. So it's pretty cool. So if we go back and look at the code in here, I'll just stop this one. So let's take the rates of pages here. So I'm actually asking the runtime to say, what operating system am I running on? But it cannot tell me. It can just say, OK, I'm running on Wasm. It can't even tell me it's Wasm time or it's Wasmer or whatever. It's just saying, OK, I just know I'm running in this byte format. Nothing more I can say. And the same with the like date time now. Normally, it would actually take my system time and show. But in this case, because it's uh, the Western time, it's uh, showing whatever is the default. And it seems like it's UTC that's default Western time. But that also means that I can inject whatever clock that I actually want in Western time to like fake being somewhere else or the server being somewhere else. So it's pretty neat. And um, let's just look at 
the CS sprite. So you can see what's inside here. So I'm running .NET 7. I have the Rathi runner here. If you're running in Visual Studio, they have done some niceness that you don't need this line. But if you're running in Linux, Mac, or anything else, you actually need to add this just to tell where you can find your runtime. And this runtime could be any runtime. You don't have to use Western time. You can use whatever you want. And the same, you can also give it some arguments. And in this case, I'm actually telling it, I want to use port 8080. And I want to map it to the 8080 local host. So I can also show you what that will look like if it doesn't work. So I'll just take my terminal down here. So here's the command that it's actually running underneath the hood. So now I'm starting my website up from the command line. And voila, here you can see it again. I'll just go back here. I'll just stop my website again. So if I actually remove this TTP listen, it will actually fail on me because it will say, hey, I'm trying to listen on this port 5000, but I haven't mapped any network access for this machine, or sorry, this module, and I'm getting this error. Hey, can you please add TTP listen to actually make it work? Do we have any questions so far, Khalid? I guess one question was, how are those images being served on that Razor page? I, I guess in my thought is it's just being hosted on ASP.NET Core and being served statically, right? Like on, on that Razor page, correct? Yeah, so um, what it does is uh, because I'm using that bundle thing, I could just say like serve the directory and serve the files from there, but I'm actually instead I'm saying I want to bundle it all into one file. Oh, wow. So all of it is inside of this file that is 34 megabytes big. So it's oh, just one cool. file deployment. And the cool thing about this, uh, I didn't mention before, that this is not platform specific. This runs on Linux, it runs on ARM, it runs on Mac, it runs everywhere. So you create the same file from all system and it runs the same way all places. Mm -hmm. So it's an open standard that is being uh, greatly created, like worked on right now and extended upon, but they all have the same thing they have to have in common. And also come a bit deeper into that because one thing is like the standard, but there's a lot of company also making their own interfaces for their own clouds. And that'll be like a couple of slides down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess the, the thought I'm having kind of watching you go through this demo, uh, and this may be one of my personal questions, like yeah. it, it seems like our industry is trending towards being secure first, right? So yeah. Um, like, do you think that's a good thing that Wazzy's doing where like whoever's deploying this has to turn on these features so that you get access yeah. to them? I, I think it's a good thing because we can even see that .NET is going the same direction that it, it's more and more secure by default. And if you want to do something insecure, of course you have these settings. Like if you need to debug some personal identifier, you know, identifiable information and stuff like that, you can turn it on. But per default, it's just turned on and off. Okay. And oh. um, also here, you can actually see the configuration that I'm just saying include all the files that is in my root and put it into the WASI file. That's cool. That's very cool. Uh, two more questions, and then we can continue yeah. the presentation. Yeah. Uh, does the generated WASM include a CLR uh, for garbage collection, or no. is it a AOT or ahead of time compiled? It's ahead of time. So um, right now, Western Time doesn't have a garbage collection. So it's bring your own. So here is where Rust really shines because they don't really have a garbage collection. They have to do it all manually by hand. While um, you saw my size of file, it was not big, but it's still like if you did the same in Rust, it would be like one megabyte. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to bring the garbage collector. You have to bring all this stuff from the .NET world to say, OK, this is how I handle the code. There is a spec for making a shared garbage collection, but it's not done yet. Mm -hmm. And it's still pretty new, all of this stuff. So even uh, 
like I have a couple of slides uh, further ahead that actually WebAssembly in .NET has been already, I think back in 2019, the first like steps were made. Mm -hmm. So it's not really new, but it's getting better and better and better. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all experimental, but it's very usable experimental. So that's yeah, exactly. pretty good, which, which kind of leads to the last question that's asked. Uh, do browsers need to turn on any settings to enable uh, WebAssembly execution? Uh, no, not at all, because the, the browsers were actually far ahead. They have had WebAssembly for a long time. So this is more like the server side trying to catch up, tagging along, mm -hmm. and that, and now extending the interfaces because right now, like there's a ton of stuff that the browser never needs, but the server actually needs. Yep, exactly. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, please continue. Uh, I'll keep watching the chat for questions. And uh, yeah, this has been great so far. Thank you so much. Yeah. So yeah, here's just the backup if everything went sideways. Actually, one thing I didn't mention is you can actually see in like the lowest part, the program file, Western time, so it's actually using WASM time to running the code from inside my debugger. So it's actually real WASM code running in the debugger. The debugger experience is not really there right now, but that's something they're working on as well. So you can run it in the debug and see how it works, but stepping over and all that kind of stuff is not really there yet. So I mentioned shortly like interface-driven development. And uh, what it is, is uh, it's too boring. Let's go on. It's better with examples. So what it is, is we already talked about, we have these interfaces that is common for rest and time and all the runtimes, but the cloud providers are also building their own interfaces. So um, yeah, like uh, we have loggers, HTTP request, GraphQL, key value stores, SQL database, and all this kind of stuff. So um, Steve Sanderson paired up with the uh, this uh, company called Suborbital and uh, made some cool demos of it. So this is like a copy paste screenshot from one of his demos. So what he's doing is he's using their interface to get a server, their interface to get a uh, cache and their interface for getting a logger. So we actually don't know about any of the implementation details. We just know that's an interface and we call their uh, implementations underneath. So again, you have like a basic server. They call it Atmo server. We started, we add a cache, and then you can start, as you see, use the cache, use the logger, and it all just works. So we don't know about the implementation. That's just something some cloud guys are using a dropdown. It might be Redis, it might be in, mem in memory, it might be something else. You don't really care because you just got an order. You need to use a cache, and then somewhere the line, you can just, uh, turn up the power, increase the, the number of machines you need, and we don't need to like think about any of that stuff. So it's pretty cool. So this is just like one of the cloud providers. So um, let me just find the browser again. So this Ferrymon is what I see as the leading inside of Western right now, not only .NET, but also for Rust and Golang. So let me just find the browser tab. I have like 10,000 things open in background. Here it is. So basically, if you want something basic up and running in WebAssembly, you can do it like here. I'll just show it. So it's not nice, but you can make a control program. You can say control right line, my header, and then my body. You can build it. You can make it into a Western file, as I showed before. It's just using the Western SDK. And then you can make a config file showing like how it should work. So it's just saying when somebody calls the root, like just the index root, I'll just run this Western file and I'll return it. And then you can see here, it's pretty simple. You curl, you get some body text, hello world. It's not very usable, it's not very friendly, but it's a good way of just running something. So where you use this is probably if you have some one-off task, you don't need to read the body or the response other than just that you return a positive or a negative answer. But they have made this spin framework that takes Western files 
and then you can do some awesome stuff with it. So let's go up here. It just scrolls a bit. So instead, we can use, now use their spin SDK. And this SDK is just an interface for their WASM uh, runtime. So what it does is it says, instead of spinning up a big ASP.NET core server and all that kind of stuff, it's a little bit like serverless functions. So you can like have a HTTP response that handles the request. You can do some stuff, pretty much what you're used to. You can do like a lot of stuff. You can also do routing inside of it and all the stuff you're used to. So if you try to make AWS lambdas or Asia functions, it's pretty similar. So if I go further down here, so they also have these interfaces. So if you want to make an outbound HTTP request to something else, they have an interface for that called HTTP outbound. So instead of you creating an HTTP client, they actually have a warm client that is ready to send a request on your behalf. So instead of you using time and memory and all that kind of stuff, they have a warm up client for that. And the same, if I scroll a bit uh, further down, they have Redis, they have Postgres, they have all these different interfaces. So instead of you thinking about having to uh, manage the like a connection pool, all that kind of stuff, they have it pre-warmed for you. And they're also using uh, something called Visor. So what this is, it's actually starting up and taking a snapshot of memory of your app. So it's ready to run as soon as you call it. So you don't have to think about uh, all the startup code uh, taking time. So it's actually pretty cool because then it's like instant startup times because it's all loaded for you. So they have this awesome blog post about how to like use it. And it's called spin. And if I like go back to the main page here, and here you can actually see it's for Go, Swift, Rust, Thick, Go, Rust, yeah. And the sad part is .NET is not mentioned anywhere. They do support it, but it's not their main focus. I've talked to the developers, and it is in their scope, and they are working on improving it, and they are making blog posts about it. So hopefully sometime soon, .NET will actually be a first-class citizen. But these are the guys I actually see as the main Western go-to guys because they have this amazing framework and they have these amazing interfaces for doing like the basic stuff. Any questions? Yeah, I guess, you know, it's more of a thought as I kind of see you demo this stuff. It's, um, it's very much like function as a service. So if anyone out yeah. there is familiar with like, uh, Azure functions or AWS Lambda, um, you know, like it's kind of the same programming model. You have a yeah. context and that context is provided to you by the provider, right? Yeah. In this case. Uh, so with Fermion, um, they're giving you all these services. Uh, have you, like in your, in your trials with this service, have you found that uh, there's anything that you think is a good abstraction? Do you feel like there's more that could be added? Um, would you prefer to even just use the C sharp stuff and have them intercept those calls? Um, like what, what's your feeling so far? Well, yeah, it's, it, I would say they have good abstractions, but the problem is also it's their abstractions. So it wouldn't work any other place. So, mm -hmm. for example, we use Dapper a lot for all our SQL needs in our company. And we really like the interfaces they give and the way we can query and update stuff and, like, get nested structures. I could hear that doing the same kind of logic in here with their wrapper is going to be held because if you have a nested structure in SQL and get it mapped to a data model, it will not be that easy. Mm. Yeah. using a, like NC framework or Debo or something else. Yeah, it's definitely, it's interesting from the perspective of like, you could see this as potentially a containerization replacement. So if you're using yeah. like Docker or any container style, containers are usually self, 
encapsulated like you have to pick the operating system but generally the entire process is self-contained yeah here here it goes even a step further past that model and yeah. um yeah like i i think portability is going to be an important part of this and as yeah. as the process evolves i'm curious to see especially in the dotnet realm if .NET will be able to solve and give these WASI providers a solution where they can intercept calls for HTTP client, um, for ADO.NET, like all the things yeah. that we're used to doing, like talking to third-party services. So um, yeah. I'm really hoping uh, that's the case. But uh, user is asking, is this lighter weight than containerization? Yeah, it is. It's very much lightweight. So as you saw before, like the interface they have made with HTTP outbound and all that kind of stuff. So the idea is that they already have these form instances of uh, doing stuff. So when you are calling the interfaces, you're actually just calling another WASM file underneath. Mm -hmm. So you only have like one megabyte of code and then you're calling all these abstractions that do all the stuff for you. And the cool stuff is, like I said before, then then it's just drop downs in the cloud provider and saying, okay, I want to change uh, from Postgres to SQL to something else, or I want to use this uh, in memory DB or whatever. So the and with Wiser, it's even faster because then you have now allocated the memory and you have already run up to a certain point, and then you can just keep running the same thing again and again, and only like doing like two lines of code running for actually doing the stuff you need to do. So yeah. for something that normally will like take only 10 milliseconds, it's not a lot of time, but with this, you can get down to one and two milliseconds response times. So it's insanely fast. Yeah, but that's um, it. Docker is not dead. Docker is a very good tool. And uh, I think it's one of the upcoming slides after the plugins. So I won't talk too much about it. Yeah, I, I will say one thing though, the and I, I think hopefully people get it as they're looking through your presentation that the mindset behind building your applications and processes should change a little bit because yeah. it is so lightweight that you can run these processes and then kill them and then bring them back up. Whereas yeah. with containers, they are longer running processes and you kind of still have to manage those resources. So like so, your mindset starts to change a little bit. So. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Like yeah. we we went from VMs like to being this much and then your code this much. Then we went to Docker where like you still have Alpine or whatever small lightweight OS. And now you go over to only having your own code because you don't need anything. You only have your byte code and it doesn't matter where it's run. Mm -hmm. So the server just needs to run the code. And again, I'll show this in uh, just a short while as well. Okay. All right, cool. So, uh, continue, continue, yeah. please. So for the module slash uh, plugin system, like uh, I think a lot of developers has tried to get a task. Okay, you're sitting here with the .NET and you have the Python team doing all like the machine learning stuff. And then you say, okay, now you two guys work together. You have to call that Python file and do some stuff. And what most of the time happens is okay, the Python guys has to make an API and you have to call the API instead of just calling the machine learning model directly. But with WASM, you can now compile both parts into WASM and just call each other with the same interface. And it just works. You, you don't need to know anything about Python or how you run Python. You know how to run WASM and that's all you need to get your day job done. And uh, one of the big players in this space that has a... Uh, use this a lot, it's a proxy called Envoy. Um, and the way they do it is they have this middleware they call filters. So when there comes a request, you go through a filter, a filter, a filter, and you go all the way down. So what you can see here is like, you have a filter, VASM filter, that just adds a header, hello from VASM. So you can actually make your own VASM filters in whatever programming language you want and just have it as part of the pipeline. So you can like check the barrel token, add headers, remove headers, all this kind of security stuff that normally is part of the pipeline in big uh, enterprises. And then you can have the different teams doing it in whatever language and just compile down to WASM. And it's pretty amazing. 
Um, right now, Envoy only have like guides for I think Schwarz and Golang, which are the two leaders in Western right now. But I'm pretty sure that uh, .NET will also be in their radar soon. I've seen a lot of uh, issues been raised, anyways, about how do we do the same stuff in uh, .NET. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, like all the way back in 2019, when the, all the stuff was good, Western wasn't that good. So this is like how it looked in .NET back then on the server side. You had to create a store, you had to allocate some memory, you had to figure out how much like input and output uh, links were and all this kind of stuff. And then you have to read the memory afterwards. And it was hell, like this is only like the tip of the iceberg of the code you needed to do. So let's take a demo again. So I'll just find my IDE. So we already went through like how to do it in the console. So let's uh, just look quickly here. I have this Watham file. Let's just take down here. So I have in this folder, I have the Watham file. And I can actually tell Watham time to invoke inside of this Fibonacci lesson, the function called Fibonacci, and I want to call it with the parameter nine. It'll just give me some warnings that this is like preview stuff in my chains into the future, but it gives me results. So it's pretty much the same way we're going to make our C-sharp code. So if I go back in here, Let's look at the past, like how it was in 2022. We have the engine. We have a module being loaded, pointing to the file, a host. And then uh, we have some ugly stuff with dynamic. So I'm just saying from this module, I want some dynamic instance. I don't know what it is. From that instance, I'm calling a dynamic function, Fibonacci, and I get a dynamic result. And I'm going to print on that dynamic result. And this is not nice at all because you don't have any idea what you're working with. So let's just look at the past, see how this works. So you have the engine. Ah, wrong button, here. So you have your engine host, the instance, the result. So I can see when it's coming out, it's an actual int, but I and beforehand, I have no idea. So this actually works. This is running code that you can actually run Vesson today, but uh, already within the last year, they have made this a lot more nice and easy to work with. Let's look at the next one. So this time I have something called config. For now, let's just ignore it. We can do a lot of awesome stuff. I have an engine. Again, I'm pointing to the file. I have a link linker. I have a store. And then I create an instance. This time, it's actually an object. From that instance, I can ask, I want to get a function that returns an int and takes an int. And the function name is Fibonacci. I can actually make null checks to check that it actually is something. And then I can actually call it and see it go out. So let's just change this into the present and debug again. Let's just put it down here. So here we can actually see I have my function int of int. And we can see like all the information that we need about it. Like this is not stuff we really, really need to think about, but this is just all the stuff that's going under the hoods. Again, I get my int back and I get my result. So right here, right now, like it's still some magic. I, I need to point to a file, of course, but I also need to know like the name of the uh, function that's inside of it. So if I wanted to, I could, of course, take the command line 
use Wasm time, inspect like the file, see what export this is and all that kind of stuff. But that's actually not that nice that you have to know everything beforehand. So I made a small prototype source generator. So I generated this code from that Wasm time thing. So it has all these public methods like call, Fibonacci, initialize, error, blah, 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 blah. So this is all stuff that is inside that file. So let's go into a program. So like here you can see I'm pointing to that file. I'm using my own source generator that created this file. And then underneath here, you can see how I created it. So let's just quickly run this. And then you can see what magic I'm using to actually create this uh, source code. So you can actually see like, just take it a bit up here. The results returned down here in the outputs. So I've actually run the code. I'll just continue. So the cool stuff is now I'm actually creating the code. So I'm loading the module, I'm creating a public class named Fibonacci. I'm making the use statements. I'm using, like uh, you saw in the file before, with the config, modules, all that kind of stuff. So if I go all the way, let's just put it down here. You can actually see I'm going through all the exports, public methods of this uh, Wasm file and creating like the methods buffet bodies and all that kind of stuff. And uh, if I go up to the module again, actually in here, you can actually inspect and see all the stuff that's in here. So here's the export for my Wasm file. I can see I have my Fibonacci. I have all this kind of extra stuff that is built in. So like flush and uh, allocate memory and all that kind of stuff. So the only thing I'm really interested in is, is just the basic Fibonacci function. But from that, I can actually create this class. So right now, it's just a simplified uh, string I'm getting, and then I'm just copy-pasting it in. But that's uh, basically, basically it. Any questions so far? Um, mostly about how do we people debug into uh, you know WebAssembly module. Um, but I guess that's more of a writer question. So, I, yeah, yeah, I don't think you can do it right now because the WebAssembly is more or less like production code. It's something that's already been shipped, mm -hmm. so it's something external. So you should see that like a NuGet package. Like, okay, of course you can do it, but it's not something just out of the gate. Mm -hmm. So Sergey has an interesting question. It's more like yeah. a philosophical one, but uh, on the high level. Is this a brand new programming paradigm meant to create a new niche, or is this a style of WebAssembly usage meant to replace Node.js applications? And um, more or less, it's actually a more plugin system, like what I'm showing right now. Because the cool thing is, like you're using NuGet packages today, but this is actually more secure, and that's what I'm going to show now as well, because this is running in a secure sandbox. So if you're running some code, like you could say to your customer, okay, we are doing all this logic. You just supply us with this Wasm file that does some basic stuff and we'll run it for you. And then it'll just run in a sandbox. And uh, what I'm going to show now is actually how much control you have over that sandbox. Mm -hmm. I just do like this. So the stuff I told you about before, like you can control everything, it's true. So the config I said, ignore. Now I'm saying, okay, I want to add fuel consumption. I want to add epoch interruption. I'm not really a fan of the names, but <laughs> what it means is more or less that I can say, I want to add fuel. So how many like instruction am I allowed to run before this code is going to fail? In the same, I can say like, you are only allowed to use this much memory. You're only allowed to run for this much time. So in this case, I'm saying you're only allowed to run for, for zero ticks. So you should be done pretty fast. Of course, this is impossible. This will throw an exception, but that's the whole point that you can sandbox it to your needs and say, okay, 
you only get 50 megabytes of memory. You get about five seconds. Anything beyond that, I will kill you, and then I'll take it up for consideration. Will I run you again with more in the future? So you can run insecure code. You can wrap your old code and just let it live in here forever because you know if this is just a console application doing some basic stuff, you can have this running forever because you don't have to be afraid that they are coming out of the sandbox. So you can have this right once and then live forever and run on whatever platform you want to run it on. So let's just run it. This is going to fail because I'm setting it to be done instantly. And of course, it won't do that. Oops. Maybe if I just change the project as well. So let's go into the present. So right now, it's just running as expected. If I go a bit down, boom. So now it's giving me this exception error while executing with backtrace. And it's caused by an interruption. So it's a WASM trap. So it's telling me, like, this has uh, stopped for a certain re reason, and, like also the line of code and all that kind of stuff. And uh, there's some more de details, like what kind of uh, trap was uh, hit? Was it like no fuel? Was it out of memory? Was it out of uh, time? All that kind of stuff. So you can dig down and like have catches for the different uh, edge cases. So it's just a trap exception that has more information on what kind of trap was uh, hit. So I just press stop here. Just go back again. So you have like tons of uh, option in here. Like, so you can see all kind of different options you have for what you want to do with your yeah runtime. What kind of limits you want and configuration. And there's uh, some also new stuff. So right now it's uh, only basic types that is allowed to be called. So when you're calling, like you saw from the uh, here, I'm just calling with a basic int. They're working on component models, so you can actually give like person objects and stuff like that. So like what you're used to in gRPC, like make a format and then passing in objects instead of just passing in a flat list of uh, basic types. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the space and it's getting better and better. I haven't tried this debug info, but there was a question earlier about debug. So you could probably like set this to true and you'll get even more debug information. I haven't tried it yet, but that's a bunch of stuff that you can do. Yeah, I think, I think to kind of also add to that question, right? The way I see a lot of this programming model, um, like, it really gives .NET developers access to all these other ecosystems that yeah. might have more capabilities in particular topics, right? So yeah. from a Python perspective, Python's really strong when it comes to machine learning, computer yeah. vision, those kind of things, and processing those uh, pieces of information. It'd be great to have most of your application written in ASP.NET but then pull in this WASM module that can do things like perform in computer vision, right? Like yeah, that would exactly. be amazing. Um, you might be doing image processing, Rust and controlling memory might be really important when you're processing images. So yeah. you can run your Rust WASM module inside your .NET application to squeeze more out of your uh, resources that you have right now. So. For me, it just opens up the world and bridges all these communities so that we can kind of share in all of the good stuff that we're all doing. So Yeah, exactly. So instead of having only Nougat packages in the future, you could have like Wesson packages as well. Yeah. And uh, like um, that's coming uh, next slide as well. But uh, you can start like encapsulating dangerous code like Right now, Nougat packages are actually a dangerous to run because can you always trust updating? Do you always go in and check what has been built and stuff like that? So with Wetham, you can actually go in and say, okay, I'll just encapsulate that Nougat package that's external to me and say, 
okay, you are allowed to run in this sandbox for a certain amount of time. And uh, if something strange happens, I'll just exit and I'll throw a warning and then our sysadmins has to look into what is happening here. So in this slide, I'm actually showing like how I hope the future is going to look because there's still a lot of boilerplate code. It's not hard, but it's still annoying. So what I would hope is like you can make an interface. You can say like it's a string input, string output, and then it will just work. Like say module load, point to the file. I have the interface. Let the compiler do all the boilerplate for me and just simply call the method. So this is what I hope that we can get to at some point, maybe with a real source uh, generator. Like right now, is mine is just like written as a big string and then getting everything out. But most of the methods in there is probably something you don't want. It's something that's compiled down from Rust or something else that you don't need to worry about. So with like with a syntax syntax like this, it would be really easy just to say. I'm only interested in these three functions. I want to be able to call them, run them, and then just forget about them. So um, in .NET 8, we already have some of this stuff that we talked about. So uh, Steve Sanderson again has made this demo where he's uh, calling an API endpoint. And in, within that API endpoint, he's using isolated runtime host. So that's actually using Western time beneath to like say, okay, I'm going to encapsulate this code and this will be run in a secure sandbox. And uh, then I'll just return whatever is being returned afterwards. So if you have some insecure code or something you're not entirely sure about, you can encapsulate it with .NET 8. I'm not entirely sure when you use it, but it's something they're working on. And now to like what I talked earlier about, Wasi and Docker. It's a, it's a match made in heaven. So let me just find the slide. Oh, sorry, the website. I'll just start closing all the old stuff. Never mind, I just opened a new tab. So, I didn't really have time to make code of everything, so that's why I'm like standing on the shoulder of giants. There's a lot of people done some awesome stuff already. So just to get to the point, like we already have all the starter stuff and stuff like that, but there's a neat feature and there's a neat trend that has been in the other communities, not in .NET, but other places like Golang and Rust. They're running this thing called distroless Docker images. So you don't have any OS, you just start building everything from scratch. So how this works is actually you can like do your project. You can add your Vati SDK, just like I did before. You can build. So this will just give you your Western file. I can publish release. And then instead of saying from .NET something something, I'll just say from scratch, which is just an empty container with nothing in, I'll just copy my file. And I'll just say entry point is my file. And what this allows us is actually to build this image that is only three, nearly four megabytes big that contains everything you need .NET related for running. And what you can then do with Docker is you can just say, I want to run this image. I want the runtime instead of being the normal Docker daemon, I want to be Wasm Edge, which is the really lightweight version of it. And then it will just run like instantly because it doesn't have any operating system. It doesn't have anything else to run other than your code. So it's a pretty neat uh, blog post. And he has a lot of uh, awesome things. Like he also mentioned in the beginning, like how he got Wasm to run on a Raspberry Pi Zero 2 that is this really, really, really lightweight uh, Raspberry Pi. That's where Wasm really shines. It can run anywhere. It can run like on the edge, beneath the sea, like on the moon, wherever you want it to run with a small battery. And it doesn't really use any energy. So. 
I'm just trying to find my mouse there. So who's actually working on this? So the main force right now is something called the Byte Code Alliance. And it's these guys. So we don't know how much they each contribute, but there's some big names like we have ARM, Amazon, Docker, Microsoft, Ferrymon, or how you pronounce their name, like Fastly. Like that's all these big players doing massive work right now. And it's really awesome. So is it production ready? Well, yes, but yeah, not really. I'd say you can start using it now if you want to, but there's going to be some uh, rough edges when you're working with it in .NET. The story is a bit different in the Rust and the Golang. Rust is like the leader right now, then we have Golang. And then there's a bunch of other players where .NET is also in the top and starting to climb as well. It's definitely on the radar and they're doing a lot of stuff. But right now the like the marketing team is working on like Blazor. So there's a bunch of benefits and there are also like some cons, like it's no silver bullet. It's a great tool for your toolkit. It's definitely something I would recommend people start looking into and perhaps being just ready to start using in the future. I think I'm uh, reaching my hour now as well. And uh, this is the last slide. I, th I think you're, I think you're okay. If you need more time, don't worry about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, if you'd like to stop here, we can stop here, but. Um, I think we can take some questions and just talk. The okay. last thing is just a huge list of good links. Uh, actually, if you open this Google slide, the list keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff, all different places like Kubernetes and the uh, KubeCon is talking about a lot about Western at this current time. Sadly, that's not that much uh, .NET related, but there is some sprinkles around. Like uh, we have the Uno project that is putting a lot of energy into Western. We also have uh, Aurelia, or what is it called, the other one, uh, UI? Avalonia. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So there, there is some .NET guys that are looking into this beside Microsoft. And uh, I think it's going to be pretty big in the next couple of years. So it's not a replacement for Docker, but it's most certainly is a nice tool to having a toolkit for really, really performance-optimized stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think you kind of hit the nail on the head when you were talking about we started like okay, we're gonna I'm gonna feel a little old saying this, but <laughs> <laughs> we started with uh PCs and hardware, right? When we start yeah. thinking about applications, we think, okay, where's my application gonna be hosted? And we thought about PCs and then we kind of went down to virtualization and virtual PCs and containers. And yeah. we seem to be moving more and more towards like the logical more than the physical, right? Yeah. So uh, I think WASI WebAssembly is taking it to its, no pun intended, logical extreme, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, Sergey asks again, would it be fair to say that all this WebAssembly plugin code that you showed us, do you think it's going to be like, NPM packages, uh, both like from an execution on the server standpoint, or even usage in the in the client side realm. Yeah, yeah, certainly because uh, already now there's a lot of. Uh, if I open some of the links I have down here, mm -hmm. so there's this uh, community called Western Builders that's already like a lot of. Uh, Western stuff being shared, like files and people building games with it and doing all kinds of uh, awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, it's only a matter of time before someone makes a Western repository for sharing Western files and code. So yeah. like people are already doing it in Docker and uh, you can already run yeah, like Western time inside of Docker. So, so it's already being done. It's just a matter of question. When do we start doing this publicly, like with NPM packages and .NET uh, NuGet packages and stuff like that? 
-hmm. because that's where I see the great stuff being uh, done. Like Rust, Rust can do some amazing stuff, like really performant uh, markdown images, uh, editing, all that kind of stuff. And while, like uh, you said, Python can make some machine learning models and make them easy to consume, just say, like, here's the package. Go nuts. Yeah, you know what's funny? And uh, like you and I were talking months ago about wouldn't it be cool if a source generator could read that module interface? Yeah. And you went ahead and did that. And to me, that was the moment where I'm like, yes, this I can see. Like you were saying, there's a lot of rough edges right now around it. Yeah. And I think the rough edges are really about how developers are going to consume this and how they program against it. Yeah. But it, it's really easy to see how the developer experience can improve. And you did a great yeah. job just, just hacking a source generator together to show that you can go from something that wasn't even written in .NET can easily be turned into something that can be consumed and idiomatically correct for the .NET audience. And they yeah. don't even have to know that there's WebAssembly there. I think yeah. that is the most exciting thing about all of this. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm so thankful that you showed that. That's that's amazing. That's awesome. I loved it. <laughs> the cool stuff is you could actually make a NuGet package that underneath has WebAssembly. Yeah. And nobody would ever know because the Western file is cross-platform to run any place. I, I am ARM, Windows, Linux. So you can already now start making wrappers around packages you find online and need to use. That's or hack something yourself. Like if you know you're using Python, then hack a, a Western file, pack a nice, uh, it into a nice NuGet package and then share it. And then suddenly people can get access to that uh, model pretty easy. You know, it's it's funny you say that. It makes me wonder, like, there has to be a NuGet package out there that already bundles some kind of WebAssembly. We just, it might be so good that a lot of people don't even know that that's happening. Yeah. So it's, again, this is the most exciting, in my opinion, one of the most exciting things happening, not even just in the .NET space, but across the board, because it breaks down the walls between all these technology stacks and really gets us kind of sharing our information or ideas and the ways that we do things. And developers now get to pick kind of their best options, regardless of what their core technology stack is. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just amazing stuff. So um, yeah, on that note, uh, yeah, if there's no other questions, uh, I think, you know, we can wrap it up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's wind down. But again, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, if you'd like more information about JetBrains products, uh, Joshua uh, and his namesake Ryder, uh, you can go uh, to jetbrains.com forward slash Ryder to get more information. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter uh, or X or I don't know what it's called now, but uh, yeah, you can also read some of our uh, .NET content on our blog, uh, blog.jetbrains.com forward slash .NET. Uh, and if you're joining us on YouTube or you're watching us on Twitch, uh, be sure to follow us, subscribe um, on our official channels there. Uh, if you want to see more from Joshua, you can go to his GitHub account, uh, Top Swag Code. Uh, I'm also trying to get Joshua to do more YouTube videos. I know he has a YouTube channel, so be sure to like and subscribe on his channel at Top Swag Code. Uh, on that note, uh, one more uh, because I need to uh, beg. Uh, again, thank you for joining us. If you like this content and want to see more of this, I know I want to see more of Joshua in the future, but <laughs> if you want to see more content around .NET stuff, around JetBrains products, uh, be sure to like and subscribe, leave some comments, tell us what you liked, what you didn't like. And as always, thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Joshua, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Bye.